Before we launch into these exciting talks, I'd like to say a few words about the CCLM. So the portal itself was launched back in April of 2020, and I hope by now all of you had a chance to visit or use the site in some way. Um, I think you'll agree with me, uh, it is a very easy to use and powerful knowledge exchange platform. You might find yourself thinking, wow, I really need to be a part of this, or I need my resources to be linked to this. If that's the case, reach out to us after the call, and we'll figure out how you can best be a part of the CCLM. So it took a lot of work to create the CCLM portal. We started back at the beginning of 2019 when five collaborating organizations came together. And we really had one thing in mind when we came together. And this was really to address the lack of a centralized place to share and exchange information and learnings in conservation and land reclamation. So the founding members back then, uh, it was myself with ECCC representing the National Boreal Caribou Knowledge Consortium, Natural Resources Canada, specifically the Canada Forest Service, Ducks Unlimited Canada, InnoTech Alberta, and the Northern American Institute of Technology, or known as NATE, and specifically their Center for Boreal Research. And we also want to thank our other supporters who really made keeping the, uh, the CCLM portal active and growing and powerful, um, you know, through some of the contributions of other organizations um, that I'd like to thank right now. And these include uh, Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, or better known as COSIA, Alberta Innovates, the Grand Prairie Regional Innovation Network, Alberta Land Use Knowledge Network, the Northern Caribou Canada Portal, and Fuse Consulting. So the result of this collaboration has been to create this really powerful go-to site for all things related to conservation and land management. And someone even said early on that we're quickly becoming the Google of conservation for Canada. And here you're going to find more than you can find anywhere else. You're going to find things like reports. You're going to find gray literature. You're going to find peer-reviewed materials. Um, you're going to find best practices, guidance documents, and you know, even some state of knowledge reports are starting to appear there. Um, it now has almost 2,000 resources. That number grows every day uh, as we grow in our membership. Um, it includes also an interactive map of boreal caribou projects, so you can see where caribou work is being done across the country. It has welcomed over 30,000 users since it launched, which is pretty impressive. Um, we have a lot of exciting new work planned for this year, uh, especially uh, work that we're thinking about um, doing is putting an interactive map that tracks conservation progress right there on the main page. We don't know how it's going to go in there, but we look forward to working on that this year. And we might start using this map to really um, answer people's questions quickly about where habitat is being restored, where lands are being protected, where trees are being planted, those sorts of things. So stay tuned for that. And secondly, uh, the long awaited addition of a fourth sub portal, and this will be a sub portal dedicated to Indigenous-led conservation. And it's going to bring together and spotlight Indigenous leadership and conservation. So again, stay tuned for that. So we are very pleased to be hosting today's presentation, featuring a series of presentations by five experts. Uh, it'll be followed by a panel discussion and audience uh, question period. It's going to be fast paced. Um, each presentation is about five to seven minutes. Uh, so you'll get a taste of what's going on in their world, but there'll be um, room for a, a discussion and some questions afterwards. Um, please help to the uh, add to the conversation. You know, these we're very used to going and listening and just, you know, hanging up when the, when it ends, but please contribute to the conversation by putting your, your question or your comment um, into the chat. You know, maybe even our presenters will leave you with a question that you can help them answer. Um, Christy, our question moderator today, will be uh, tracking the questions and reading them out to the presenters. So my goal today is to learn all about the world of drones, but I'm sure it'll all just go right over my head. Pause for laughter. Um, <laughs> it is now my pleasure to introduce you all to our first presenter and a friend of mine. Uh, so first up, we'll have Morgan Rennick, who is a physical scientist within Environment and Climate Change Canada's Science and Technology branch. And I know this because Morgan works just down the hall from me. Uh, so a little bit about Morgan. Um, she received a BSc from the University of Guelph, an MSc in Environmental and Life Sciences from Trent University, and a postgraduate diploma in Geographic Information Systems from Algonquin College. 
She joined the science and technology branch of ECCC back in 2019, so a relatively new member. Um, her research interests include exploring and de developing new applications of unoccupied aerial vehicles with the goal of monitoring wildlife and mapping environmental change. And I'll have to say, like, you know, first five minutes about you know, talking to Morgan about her research really had me inspired and thinking we really need to have a knowledge exchange dedicated to this. So I'm really happy to welcome you as our first speaker, Morgan. Well, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here and thank you for that introduction. Um, so I guess we'll just jump into it. Well, let me see. There you go. All right. So uh, my presentation is on bank swallows. Bank swallows were designated as a threatened species by the Species at Risk Act due to their long-term population decline of 98% over the last 40 years. The remaining breeding population of 2.4 million should become stable and improve if we're able to conserve their critical habitat. However, some of this habitat, including the post-breeding nocturnal roost locations, remain largely undocumented. But it may be possible to better identify these locations using UAVs. That being said, uh, we need to walk before we can run. So to start off, we first need to answer the fairly basic straightforward question of, can a UAV-based survey method be used to estimate bank swallow abundance in freestanding wetland vegetation? In order to answer this question, we selected Big Creek National Wildlife Area for our surveys uh, because it's an area where bank swallows have been observed flocking to for their nocturnal roosting. In order to further narrow down our flight AOIs, uh, we had help from ornithologists at Bird Cities Canada who were able to identify bank swallows based on their flocking formation, plumage, and their bird calls. So using this information, we were able to observe the birds congregating and settling into certain areas of the wetland. We then used that information to plan our uh, UAV flight surveys. To conduct the UAV surveys, we use the DJI Matrice 300 with real-time kinematic capabilities. For the payload, we use the Zenus H20T camera, which is a thermal sensor. In total, we flew six AOIs from August 9th to August 12th of last year, between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. In total, we collected around 2,000 thermal images. And on the right-hand side of the screen here, you should be able to see what the Matrice looks like taking off at night there. Here's an example of what some of that thermal imagery looks like uh, that was collected from these UAV surveys. And the main thing that I'd like you guys to take away from this, um, from this screen here is that each of these small orange dots against the purple background actually represents a bank swallow, which means that we are able to detect the individual animals using the UAV and the selected flight parameters that we flew at. That being said, there's two things I'd like to make note of. The first is that even though we can see the birds in the imagery, that doesn't mean we want to go through all 2,000 images and count them manually. Uh, the second thing I'd like to point out is that the imagery really isn't perfect. There is still quite a bit of noise present in each of our images. Uh, therefore, in order to automate the counting of individual birds, we had to apply several uh, different processing steps to our imagery, including a Gaussian difference, rescaling of the intensity values, and finally, applying a binary threshold. And this allows us to separate the birds from their background environment. This binary image can then be used as input for image segmentation and then extracting a bird count from that. Using this method, we can estimate the number of birds detected in each image and compare this predicted value to our manual interpretation. So for example, the image from the last slide has an estimated 151 birds uh, with about a 97% accuracy. I would like to point out though, uh, this is a fairly ideal image. The model itself is really only about 88% accurate. Um, but what really excites me about this is that we can actually take this method and scale it up and then combine it with land cover classifications, which allow us to estimate the number of birds roosting in a given vegetation patch. So for example, this vegetation patch that's just on the right-hand side of the screen has an estimated 16,500 birds, uh, which were counted using this automated method. And the resulting density is about 0.75 birds per meter squared. So in conclusion, uh, UAVs are providing new opportunities for how we're able to monitor wild animal populations. 
They allow us to access difficult environments like wetlands at night uh, with minimal disturbance to the wildlife being monitored. Finally, by combining UAV acquired data with image processing methods, we can support conservation efforts by answering questions around habitat segmentation uh, and selection and potentially contribute to more accurate population estimates, uh, which is something that we're actually starting to see be echoed more and more in the literature too. And I've just got two examples of that right here. So with that, I just want to say a quick thank you to my manager, Jason Duffy, and to Greg Mitchell, who made this work possible. Also, thank you to my colleagues in the Geomatics Lab, and of course, to everyone here today who tuned in. And I'm really happy that we get to share this work with you. Thank you so much, Morgan. That's It, it always blows my mind what you can detect um, using this technology. Christy, um, I'll open the floor to you to, to ask some of the questions that have popped up. Sorry, we have, how did you determine 97% accuracy of identifying the presence of the birds? Sure, so that was just for that one image. The overall model is around 88%. And so how we determined this is we did a random subsample of several images from the overall data set, applied a manual count there, applied the automated count, and then compared the two data sets. Great. From Sherry, curious imagery is at night and did AI become useful for the extractions of the observations? So there's, sorry, kind of few, there's kind of a few questions so we can let you get to that one first. <laughs> sure, so if the question is around AI for identifying the birds, um, that is something that I would like to explore more of. I've looked a little bit into it, um, but I did run into some problems where Generally, machine learning, in order to identify the individual birds, um, it requires a little bit more detail than we actually have in the image. So most AI programs uh, rely on red, green, blue imagery, so natural color composites, the way we see imagery. This is just thermals. We only have the one band, and we have a fairly low detail and resolution with it as well. Great. And then she also asked if the 0.75 birds per meter squares, is, is that during the time from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. as well as an estimate of the count? Yeah, so that's just based off of the count in the imagery um, and the overall area that the imagery was covering to get that density. So it's based, yeah, between those two time frames of 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. I think specifically for that area, it was around 1230 a.m. Great. The next from Matthew, do you require a special flight certificate from Transport Canada for night flying? If so, was it, did, was it a difficult process? So you don't need a special license to be able to fly at night. Um, you can use your basic license for that. Um, however, you do need to have appropriate lighting on your UAV in order to fly at night so that it can be uh, detected by anything else in the area. And you still need to maintain line of sight. Great. And the next question from Erica is just asking if you can share in the chat the DOIs of any published papers mentioned in the talk. So just sure. lighting up for you and other present, presenters. And another question is what software did you use for image processing? Um, so I actually explored a lot of different softwares for image processing. Uh, what I ended up landing on um, was using Scikit Tools, which is a Python tool set. Um, but Funny enough, I actually explored a lot of um, Image J, which is a tool set used by cell biologists because cell biologists need to count a lot of cells. And there's a lot of similarities between working with thermal imagery and working with uh, phosphorescent imagery. Great. But yeah, there's a lot of um, freely available tools for working with data like this. Um, and most of them are, are available through something like Python or Java. Another question is, what was your flight offset for Optimum acquisition? We are using the same hardware for this or using the same hardware for the same objective. I think it's were you using the same hardware for the same objective? Sure. So the flight offset is then the uh, geolocation accuracy of where the images are. Is that sort of what you're getting at? Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm just not sure how the question was typed, but it's what was your flight offset for optimum acquisition? We are using the same hardware for the same objective. I'm not sure if that's- a So question. I'm a little unclear of what's meant by flight offset, but there's two ways that I would interpret that. 
the first that I'll say is the altitude that we were flying at was 25 meters was the lowest one. Uh, we also flew at 50 meters just for comparison purposes, but it was a lot harder to detect the birds in that uh, resolution. Um, if we're speaking about offset with relation to geolocation, um, we're probably, mm, I wanna say 0 0.5 to one meter offset for that. And that's something that we're going to be improving on for next year. Great, that looks like you answered their question. So thanks, and that's okay. <laughs> end of our questions for Morgan. Thank you, Morgan. Nice. Great. Thank you so yeah. much. Well, and Morgan, there's one more that was right at the start that I think Christy might have missed. It was just, and I'm kind of curious about this one too. What's the okay. cost? Like, what does it cost to, what well, for base cost? Base cost. That's a really good question. Um, I don't actually know what the base cost of this specific setup is. I probably should, um, but I don't really do the purchasing. So, <laughs> um, A question for Jason. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. run Jason and we'll get back to this group. Yeah, sometimes I don't like to know the cost. It freaks me out a little bit too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's just over the course of the day, I'm going to be asking myself that. I'm going to be like, okay, so compared to Morgan's, how much more or less does this type of study cost? So mm -hmm. that's yeah, I'll maybe really? follow up on that one. And Travis and and everyone else, maybe the same question for you. Um, great. Well, I will uh, I will take it from there. Thank you so much, Morgan. That was really great. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, uh, Travis Krebs. I've had the pleasure of meeting Travis. Um, Travis, I believe you were part of the group that came here to Ottawa to talk about um, your drone technology. Um, but he is co-CEO of a company known as Super Wake, which is also what I call my extra strong coffee in the morning. Uh, he has a background in aerodynamic design, focusing on the aerodynamic analysis and design of drone aircraft. Um, he holds a bachelor's and doctoral degree from the uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. In 2019, he helped co-fund the company Superwake, which builds and operates long endurance, solar powered drone aircraft. Um, I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, so I'm kind of excited uh, for him to be here today. Uh, so he and the team are using these aircraft to gather data for conservation and other um, use cases centered around environmental protection, beginning with wildlife censusing and habitat mapping. So with that, I'd like to offer you the microphone, Travis. Thank you very much, Matthew. And hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about long endurance drones and wildlife censusing. So at Superwake, we've been doing this um, for two seasons now. So we're in our second season. Uh, and I'm going to share some of what we've learned kind of at a high level, because I know we do have a, a time crunch here today. Um, but first, I would like to give some context to the term long endurance, because I know there's a million different kinds of drones out there. Um, so I'll give a quick overview of what we, we use for this type of work, that, that aircraft that Matt was just describing. Um, so, so you can have that as an example. Um, so our aircraft weighs uh, about 20 kilograms, depending on, on the batteries that are in there. And it has a wingspan of six meters. So, so it's quite large um, compared to most drones. Um, it's uh, all electric, so it uses battery and solar power. Uh, and our longest flight to date is uh, just over 32 hours. Although typically for wildlife censusing, we're only flying about seven to nine hours a day. So we're not really using all of that potential. Um, our aircraft carry gimbaled cameras uh, that have thermal and color video. Um, and the color video has a 20 times optical zoom. So we can really see uh, quite far out from the aircraft. Um, and lastly, uh, we've, flown uh, quite regularly in temperatures down to minus 30 um, because uh, our surveying has been done in the winter up until now. Um, so that's our aircraft in a nutshell. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, if you have a drone that can fly for a few hours at a time and carry a good quality camera uh, and can handle the cold, um, then you can sense this wildlife. Um, I'll touch briefly now on, on how we go about surveying. So this picture on the right um, is an example of the flight path of the drone. Um, in this case, we covered about 300 square kilometers. Um, so we fly throughout the day because we use the color camera to, to help us ID the wildlife that we come across. It would be tough to do that on um, infrared only. Um, and like I said, up until now, we've flown in the winter um, because that's when this sort of thing is typically done um, with the helicopter surveys. Uh, 
to date, we've also only done full coverage surveys. So when we fly an area, we cover that entire area. Usually our transect widths are about 750 meters. Uh, and then when we come across an animal, we'll loiter the aircraft over it until we get um, a positive ID and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, typically we can cover about an average of 30 square kilometers per hour uh, at full coverage with one drone. Uh, so that gives you a sense of, of uh, our area coverage rate. Um, and with that, I can show you some of what we see from the drone. So I'll start with infrared. Um, so the image on the left here, um, you can see a little white spot right in the middle. So that's a moose. And um, in this case, it was just over uh, 800 meters away. Um, so they do show up pretty bright on the infrared. Um, the image on the right here is two moose uh, in some trees. Um, in this case, they're just over 200 meters away. Um, this one was actually, this was a cow-calf pair that we came across, which was um, pretty neat to see. Um, but yeah, the infrared is um, really well suited to this sort of thing, uh, especially in the winter, you know, when the trees are pretty bare and you have good thermal contrast. Um, it's already, it's always pretty clear when you come across an animal, even if they're quite a ways away. Um, next up, I have a couple color images here. Um, so in this case, you can see the zoom really helps us get a good picture, which is like very helpful, especially when we're trying to ID something like white tail versus mule deer, where you really need um, a high level of detail. Uh, another thing I wanted to, to get across is this type of drone it is, is quite quiet. So when we're loitering overhead of these animals, they don't really seem to notice or care. Um, so we've watched moose, deer, and elk while they um, eat or sleep, and uh, they don't really seem to mind at all. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to talk uh, briefly about the benefits and challenges of, of using drones for wildlife censusing um, based on our experience. Um, and I'll start with what I see as benefits. So Number one is reduced risk compared to crewed aircraft. Um, this is a big point for some of the provinces we've talked to. Um, they just want to get people out of the helicopters for safety reasons. Um, next up is uh, you have more data available. Like using drones gives you more access to this data that can be saved and reviewed later. So for example, now you have a video record of um, each survey and you can return to that footage um, if you need to or you want to down the road. Um, also, we obviously have the time and location of the sightings, but we also have a bunch of other data like environmental factors like temperature, wind speed, cloud cover. Now that's not really important right now, but down the line, um, who knows. Uh, Another benefit I see is um, the potential for automation. So in theory, you could do these surveys more frequently and consistently, the more you kind of automate it over time. So, you know, five, 10 years down the line, we may be able to do these um, more frequently or cover more area regularly. Um, and lastly, for benefits, um, yeah, we, we don't really seem to disturb the wildlife. So that opens up some interesting possibilities, I think. Um, so, for example, right now um, we have a job where we're surveying areas close to farming operations where helicopters can't go. Um, this is to identify uh, artificial feeding sites used by wildlife. So that's like something that we can do that's kind of new and, and interesting. Um, so those are the benefits. Now, challenges. So first up, regulatory challenges. So. Right now, we have to stay within visual line of sight of the drone unless we get special permissions from Transport Canada, um, which is given on a case by case basis. So um, TC says big changes are expected soon to these regulations, but for now it's kind of a complicated and uh, burdensome process. And secondly, um, we're still in the very early stages of drone development. So Companies come and go, hardware is constantly changing, regulations are constantly changing, like new types of drones keep popping up, new camera systems. Um, so it is all very, moving very quickly. Uh, you know, you can buy a drone one day and the next day it, it seems obsolete. So it, it is very tumultuous. Um, so those are what I see as the benefits and challenges of using drones for wildlife surveying. Um, I do see now I've used my seven minutes. So with that, I will uh, hand it back to Matthew. 
Fantastic. Thanks so much, Travis. I was just watching the, the questions appear in the chat log. There are so many. Um, anyway, I, I won't take up any airspace. Christy, I'll hand it over to you to maybe get to some of these questions. Great. We have a couple. Um, Christy wasn't sure if they addressed this in the presentation, but her question is, what is the altitude typically flown for wildlife surveys? And with that particular dr drone use, what is the maximum altitude you can fly? So legally, um, without special permission from Transfer Canada, we have to keep it under 120 meters. So usually we're somewhere between 100 and 120 meters when we do this survey. Great. And the next question from Anthony is, I belong to a search and rescue team in New York where they have started to use drones to look for lost persons. Are you considering using your drones in this way? The thermal imaging at night would be very helpful in finding someone. Yeah, it, it's something we've been thinking about. Like there are a lot of use cases out there that we think this could apply for, but it's kind of hard to, to, to tackle all of them, right? So we, right now we're working on the wildlife um, and conservation use cases, but yeah, there, there are a million things we, we want to try out with it for sure, including search and rescue. Great. Um, another question, are drones used for traditional distance sampling transects? I imagine ID is less certain at further distances, but running those types of transects might be more efficient. Yeah, yeah. So like I mentioned, we've only done full coverage because that's what we've been asked to do. So we don't have experience doing a distance method yet, although um, we are hoping to look into to care stuff this year and for that we have to cover a lot more area right so then we might switch to to a distance method great i think we have time for one more and then i'll uh let uh, travis address any more in the chat but the last question is how much does conifer versus deciduous canopy cover impact detections that's a very good question and um the areas we've flown right now they don't have a lot of tree cover so we've had it kind of easy up until now but one of the things we want to look at this year um, is flying in like spring or summer so we can see how the changing canopy cover impacts our ability to to detect with the infrared um, so it's a good question i don't have a clear-cut answer on that yet but we're looking to to get a better sense of that this year Great. Thank you, Travis. Fantastic. Thanks, Travis. I'm so glad you could join us. Um, selfishly, I've been working uh, and closely with Travis and his, his colleagues to see if there's innovations for caribou monitoring with this technology. So looking forward to continue those conversations and, and the panel discussion later on. Uh, so next, it's my pleasure to introduce our third speaker, Greg McDermott. Uh, Greg McDermott is a geospatial scientist with the Department of Geology, or sorry, Geography at the University of Calgary. He is also the director of that department's Applied Geospatial Research Group. Uh, Greg completed his undergrad and his master's from the University of Calgary and a PhD at the University of Waterloo in the areas of physical geography, GIS, and environmental remote sensing. His research focuses on the application of remote sensing and other geospatial tools for restoration, assessment, wildlife habitat modeling, and other ecological issues. And I'm particularly interested about the restoration assessment because at the consortium where I work, we often hear um, how can we use remote sensing to tell us more about restoration efforts? And so it's my pleasure to hand the microphone over to Greg and thank him for being here with us today. I know he was stranded um, in an airport for most of yesterday. So, so thank you for being here today. No worries. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going to talk to you today about what I see as key targets for restoration monitoring an assessment with drones. And you'll note that no one can decide what to call these things, so I'll probably stick with drones. I've been working with them for about 10 years, and I would say that they're probably one of the three most important frontiers in remote sensing right now, alongside machine learning and satellite time series. The reason why I'm excited about drones is for two things. I mean, first of all, I think that they really democratize the process of remote sensing. Anyone now can collect very high quality remote sensing data with relatively modest investment. And secondly, it provides a unique scale of observation. I've seen this time and time again, you get a drone for something that you think you're gonna want it for. And then very quickly, you realize that you're seeing something unique that you've never noticed before because it fills this really unique gap in scale that we've never really had access to before. 
So when I'm talking about these targets here, I'm going to highlight sort of two types of targets. Now, I don't have a lot of time here, so I'm going to show you maybe one thing that you would have predicted we'd try to do with drones in a, in a restoration context. And then the second thing is like these things that you didn't realize that were, that were going to happen. So a little bit of context here. I mean, I'm, I think I'm fortunate with this audience. You probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, my project is a Boreal Ecosystem Recovery and Assessment pro Program. And what we do is we look at industrial disturbances in the Alberta Boreal Forest. Um, in this part of the world, we've got a lot of seismic lines. These are um, linear exploration corridors that are used to locate subsurface petroleum deposits. These sort of two to 10 meter wide disturbances have been cut through the forest in Alberta since the 1940s. So you can imagine we've got a lot of them. Um, there's more than 1.8 million kilometers of lines um, in Alberta alone, and they regularly occur. Density is exceeding 10 kilometers per kilometer squared. So there's a lot of uh, impacts on these things, as I'm sure you can imagine, including caribou and carbon and lots of other things we value the forest for. So there's a lot of effort into, you know, how do we restore these lines? Um, we're working about a lot of, on a lot of topics here. Um, I've only got a few minutes, so I'm going to have to be very brief. Um, this is a partial list of the things that we try and use remote sensing for in Barra. I can only touch on a couple. They're not all drone targets, to be sure. But like I say, I'm going to talk about one thing that I think you would expect, which is seedling detection and stocking, and then maybe one thing that you might not have expected. So moving quickly, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the environmental framework we work at here in the province, the Provincial Restoration Framework for Legacy Seismic Lines. Um, these are designed to identify lines that could benefit from treatment and then guide the treatment of those lines to help promote a return to forest cover and limit movement on the lines. Now, um, there are two surveys that go into these um, treatments after they've been established. The first is a survival assessment, sort of two to five years after the lines have been treated, and then there's an establishment survey eight to 10 years later. Now, um, you might ask yourself, with hundreds of thousands of kilometers of lines to be assessed after treatment, um, you know, can we get away with boots on the ground? I mean, can we just fly drones over these lines and, and sort of assess how well the treatments have happened? And what we're really talking about here is stocking surveys. So stocking surveys is something that's very well known. We do it in harvest blocks. And now we're trying to do it on seismic lines. The challenge here, of course, the seismic lines are very narrow. They're shaded by the surrounding vegetation, and there's lots and lots and lots of them. But still, you can imagine here, I'm looking at a couple of kilometers of seismic lines. Um, you can see, hopefully, the line running east-west here, and then the more heavily used line running north-south. And you can imagine, if I were to just zoom in a little bit in my imagery, you know, maybe I can see what needs to be seen. And sure enough, um, sorry, that moved a little quicker than I expected. But sure enough, here's a, here's a little plot that we've established. Um, this is a 100 square meter plot with a bunch of 10 meter square subplots here. If I zoom in a little bit further, then yes, indeed, um, you can practically count every needle on every tree here. So it wouldn't be that difficult to imagine yourself performing an aerial stocking assessment using data like this, where you can just literally count the seedlings and regenerating saplings on the line. So this is something that we started working on a few years back now. Um, so you can just imagine hovering your drone over a line. Um, so here we've got some GPS reference seedlings. They're a little bit difficult to see here, but we can essentially use an object detector to pick out the seedlings that are hidden um, in the background here and classify them. So seedling detection rate of about 75%. So there's a, a paper on this subject that I can provide the reference to if anyone is interested, came out a few years ago now. Um, we've sort of taken this topic quite a bit further since then because we want to be able to do this more automatically in over a wider variety of, of landscapes. So I have a postdoc right now trying to develop um, an AI, um, basically tree finder that will process drone data and find the various species of seedlings and other vegetation of interest automatically. So um, we're working on some data right now. We've got 2,000 seedlings that have been field measured um, and located, and we're able to locate those seedlings with a precision of about 87% under good conditions. It's a little bit more complicated than what I'm portraying here, but 
um, due to time, I'm going to have to sort of skip on through. Um, one thing that I will point out is that obviously, as the seedlings become larger, our ability to detect them becomes greater. So for example, trees greater than 90 centimeters, um, we can detect those things fairly well. Um, whereas really small seedlings, you know, we, we have a, a less chance of being able to find them. First of all, because they're hard to see. And secondly, because a lot of times they're obscured by other vegetation. Okay, like I said, I was gonna toss out one more thing that you may not have expected that we'd be trying to do with drones, and that is microtopography. So if you're familiar um, with seismic lines and, and peatlands, which is where we have the biggest problems, um, it often comes down to the lack of microtopography. So the equipment that's used to cut these lines essentially simplifies the microtopography. And here we've got a line running through a fen, and this is a bit of an extreme example. This is probably a winter road, but you can see that the microtopography has been simplified and it's a little bit lower than the surrounding peatland. There's none of that hummock and hollow microtopography. And so rather than worrying about counting seedlings, maybe one thing we need to be able to do is just find the places where there's no microtopography on seismic lines. And this is exactly what we're able to do with good imagery. So this is imagery that's been processed such that we've essentially removed all the vegetation. We're looking at a very, very accurate digital terrain model. And you can see the microtopography hummocks and hollows in this fen. And you can notice the lines running through here where you can see that the microtopography has been lost. And so we've got a project going now where we've got you know, a couple thousand RTK points and we're, we're recording root mean square errors of less than 20 centimeters using drone flown imagery. Um, so you can imagine that all you really need to do is clip out the lines, and then we can find the places where microtopography has been really flattened, and we should probably go in and treat there. And we can also see places where we've got good microtopography, which is the foundation for, um, you know, regenerating um, lines anyhow, and they should probably be left alone. Now, we can take this quite a bit further. I'm not going to talk about depth to water and methane emissions and things like that we can estimate, but we can do things using this type of data that I don't think anyone really anticipated being able to do until we noticed the detail that was in the imagery. So I can see I'm out of time. Um, I could have filled your whole hour very easily, but I will stop there and turn it back to the moderator. Great, thank you, Greg. That's super interesting. Um, lots of comments about it. it's interesting and just uh, people asking if you can post the link to the papers you referenced in the chat. Uh, so a couple other questions coming in. My chat just moved on me. One second. Yeah, I was busy typing my question. <laughs> okay. We will get we'll have time for maybe one or two. So from Anthony, in parts of Europe, they've been using drones to locate Asian hornet nests high up in trees where they try to eradicate them. These invasive hornets are becoming troublesome with various pollinators, especially the honeybee. So that was more of a comment. Let me see if I can find a question. Here's one from Matt. The resolution is astounding. After flying a survey, is any effort made to work with local indigenous communities to highlight regions that should be off limits for culturally significant reasons, for example, locations of burial grounds, trap lines, etc. Uh, the short answer, Matt, is no. Um, we've not been that successful in engaging meaningfully with local indigenous groups. Um, I frankly wouldn't even know what to look for, but it, like you say, it's one of those things that you probably wouldn't even know you could see unless you had an eye for it. So I'd be very interested in, in having people who know what they're looking at, look at this imagery and see what they can see what they can find. Great, I, I think we have to move on to our next speaker, but if anyone else has any questions for Greg, please type them in the chat and hopefully he can get to them for you. Thank you, Greg. Great, thank you so much, Greg. I hope my audio is coming through all right. There was a problem a moment ago. Just uh, Morgan, give me a thumbs up if you go. Okay, I see Christy. All right, so it's my great pleasure to now uh, pass things over to uh, Denny Dagenhart, um, who uh, is 
a reclamation research scientist with CFS or the Canadian Forest Service. She is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Renewable Resources at the University of Alberta, my alma mater, so props there. Danny received a BSc in chemistry from the University of Alberta and an MSc and PhD in soil science from the University of Saskatchewan. So currently she is working with a team of multidisciplinary researchers to develop reclamation techniques and technologies to accelerate the creation of uh, sustainable forest ecosystems post-industrial disturbances. This is a topic that is very important these days. So take it away, Danny. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, I am presenting this work on behalf of my team. Uh, it was Angie who actually came up with the title of their talk. I thought it was kind of clever. Uh, so seeing the forest through the point clouds, advancing the application of remote sensing technologies in land reclamation monitoring. Um, so I am a soil chemist by training. Uh, I'll just preface this talk by saying I'm not a remote sensing uh, scientist. Uh, I work actually mostly with plant ecologists on my team. Um, our research at CFS primarily focuses on reclamation of tailings, remediating OSPW, which is um, oil sand process effective water. We also look at how to improve shrub propagation for reclamation in the oil sand. So you guys are probably wondering, why are we, what are we doing with remote sensing? So as part of reclamation research, we've done our fair share of uh, reclamation monitoring. And I'm talking about boots on the ground, laying out veg plots, counting trees, measuring heights, DBH, and whether it's on a well site, mine site, or seismic lines, these plots are laid out systematically so they are representative of the site. Um, but most of the time, these plots only cover less than 10% of the actual area that we're measuring. So um, I hate to say this, but <laughs> uh, we can't really wait for the regulators to tell us how to improve monitoring. And, and I know there are a few regulators in this presentation today. Um, so I really think that scientists and innovators are really well positioned to adopt new technologies, especially in moving the dials when it comes to innovation. So here we are um, with remote sensing. So we started this work um, just a few years ago, but I know remote sensing has been used widely in forestry. Um, there are different data you can collect with remote sensing, photogrammetry, spectral imagery, LIDAR, 3D point clouds. Um, and I think we kind of honed in on LIDAR because we know that it's able to penetrate through the different vegetation layers. Um, and you can certainly develop or deliver LIDAR data from different platforms, satellite, airborne, UAV, terrestrial. And so for reclamation monitoring, what we are looking for is that wall-to-wall -wall data coverage. And for us, it's, it's that comprehensive representation of the entire site that is really attractive. As well, this data is audible, so that means you can go back and look at that data again. Um, it's certainly more objective than having folks out measuring trees and handwriting that data on their uh, right in the rain paper as well as it's very visual um, but there's certainly unique challenges that comes to reclamation sites we're talking uh, mixed species often sometimes in clusters or in rows um, we have a very diverse understory species um, and we're dealing with smaller trees like um, greg has mentioned previously um, so we have really um, focused uh, the last couple of years looking at high density LIDAR point clouds, because we know that it's able to have, give us that fine resolution that can cover through the different vegetation layer to really accurately depict the area that we're looking at, um, especially when it comes to small trees and these dense understory vegetation. Um, so what I mean when I say point cloud, it's really looking at um, the measurement of uh, density, which is really number of points per area, a given area. So if you're looking at large trees, you're still going to have more points, even at a low density resolution because of the size of the trees and the area that it covers. Um, so for small trees, where, when you have lower density or lower resolution, you're going to have fewer points. So in this case, we really want to get that 
high density resolution to capture those small trees. And so the only way to get high density LIDAR data is really through UAV or mobile LIDAR. Um, so in our group, what we're hoping to develop is this pipeline, which is currently called Remote Sensing for Reclamation Monitoring Deployment Pipeline. And we're, we're happy to take uh, name suggestions. So if anybody has a better name for this pipeline, uh, I'm happy to uh, take suggestions right now. Um, and certainly the, the objectives or the overarching goal for us is to see if we can use remote sensing data to support regen survey and as well as audit well site reclamation certification. So right now in this pipeline, we have four major steps. So we are, we kind of separated out into data collection, pre-processing, tree delineation, and then classification. So under each of these big steps, there are multiple um, sub steps, I guess, sub, sub parts that we go through. Um, and hopefully what we come out at the end of this is a guide to help people collect that data, process that data and classify their data. Um, so right now, currently we are testing um, multiple conditions, algorithms at each of these steps to identify the most efficient and accurate way to employ it. Um, and I've learned uh, in the past few years that remote sensing has a high bar of entry, both in skill and also software. Um, so what we're hoping to do at CFS is utilize open source software. Um, so these would be free to everybody and hopefully we can refine the process from beginning to end or cradle to graves to implement this. So make it more accessible for everybody. And currently we've been looking at uh, uh, these UAV LIDAR data collected on uh, reclaimed well sites. So these are just south of Grand Prairie. And what we're doing currently is just to compare traditionally collected circular plot data with georeferenced trees of these species. And then we're processing that in um, Cloud Compare R and Python. And as well, we're We've also collected um, LiDAR data on oil sand mine, and this year we're going back to collect multispectral imagery data, hoping to see if, if we can use multispectral imagery to help species classification. Um, so these are sites that we have both the establishment and uh, regen survey collected at five years and 12 years. So um, that's a really quick overview of what we do um, at CFS. And yeah, if you guys are interested, you're more than welcome to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. That's our handle right there. So I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks, Danny. There is one that came in from Sherry and she's just noting some of the negative impacts of tailing ponds. And her question is, have you been asked by the regulator in Alberta to focus on HD LIDAR use of data for their monitoring of tailing ponds? No, I have not. Um, but certainly that's something that um, we could consider. I'm not really sure um, if AER has their own uh, monitoring group that focuses on that because um, certainly that's outside of what we do at CFS. But. Yeah, and Sherry did note that AER could be aware of these technologies. Um, For sure. Yeah, another question. How do you see drones being used to monitor forest and land reclamation after a wildfire? Also, are they used at all during an actual wildfire? Thank you. Um, I would be happy to direct you to the wildfire group here at CFS. Um, I know that they are using remote sensing to look at fuel loads. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether or not you can actually fly a drone during a wildfire. I would imagine there would be some challenges. Um, but yeah, there, you know, there are many folks here at CFS that are looking into how to apply remote sensing technologies and um, fire monitoring and, and some of that forecasting work. 
Great. Thanks, Danny. I'm going to close out the questions for Danny there, and she can look at the ones in the chat. And I think a couple might even be addressed in the panel discussion that's coming. So I'll hand it over to Matt. Thanks, Danny. Great. Yes, thank you so much, Danny. And yeah, please do take a look at those questions. I, I noticed um, a lot of them are starting to appear for you. Um, Next, it is my pleasure to introduce our final speaker before our panel conversation. And so I'll be introducing Marcus Becker. Uh, Marcus is a, st a statistical ecologist who works for the Alberta Bio Mon Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, better known as ABMI. In his current role, he analyzes data collected from remote camera traps uh, to report on provincial mammal habitat associations, abundance, and trends, as well as develops tools and methods for other scientists to help with their data analysis and workflows. So Marcus, I can tell you there's people on this call that I know that are interested in just that. Um, Marcus has an MSc from the University of Alberta and has experience with projects involving ecosystem service quantification and assessment, species at risk ecology, and farm level analyses of environmentally beneficial management practices. So Marcus's presentation will give a slightly different perspective than our other presenters today in that he'll be sharing his extensive experience using remote camera traps. And this was done intentionally um, because we think that there's probably some synergies to be had between all of these people across the country who are using huge camera trap networks combined with potentially some drone information. So with that, Marcus, maybe I'll just hand the microphone over to you to introduce us to the world uh, in which you work. Great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. I do. I do feel like a bit of a black sheet, but uh, it's uh, I'll represent the boots on the ground approach a little bit, but uh, it's been great to hear hear the aerial perspective so far. Um, yeah, so I, my name's Marcus. I work for the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, which is based out of the University of Alberta here in Edmonton, but it's a provincial um, organ not not for profit organization and we're we do many things, but one of the things we're tasked with is the, um, the monitoring of, of multi-taxa um, biodiversity across the province to report on trend and things like that, and trend in population. Um, let's see. So yeah, we've been using remote camera traps since about 2015. Um, this, this map's a little outdated now. We've in the subsequent few years, we've expanded to the northwest of the province and a bit more into the foothills as well. And we do a lot of targeted sampling, especially in the oil sands region. Um, but our, our goal with this data and this monitoring effort is to report on trend in species populations, to report that information to decision makers. And we use the data to develop models of habitat association, um, response to human disturbance, that kind of thing as well. Um, so we have at my fingertips, I've got roughly 5,000 camera trap um, ute sites over the last six or seven years um, to build these kind of models with. Um, I won't get uh, into too much of, of how we use the data. There's a lot of uh, flavors of camera trap data analysis. Uh, the way that we do it is we we use the camera traps as a as a quadrat. Um, sampling approach. So rather than laying a big square or a transect, we, we set up the camera and instead of counting trees, we count animals, the number of animals that come across our, our quadrat over time. And we add up the amount of time that they spend in that sampling area. And we report metrics like uh, density, number of animals per unit area. Um, so using cameras as a tool for, in our case, wildlife monitoring, uh, focally. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about features and bugs. Uh, you know, like, like Travis said earlier, there's sort of pros and cons to every approach. Um, I think one of the features that most people think of immediately with cameras is just continuous monitoring over long periods of time, right? You can set up a camera trap in the wilderness and you can leave it there for over, over a year, generally speaking, even in, in harsh climates like Northern Alberta. Um, if you know if you have a, a good quality camera trap and so you can really get a nice sense of what's going on within a long period of time seasonal variation thing like things like that um the bugs i i always try to hammer home the point that that cameras are really sampling an area that is tiny relative to the landscape they're meant to represent right so like a, a, a camera like the effective area that a camera samples is maybe 
15 to 30 meters squared. Whereas if, if you're extrapolating that out to a whole landscape, that's hundreds of kilometers squared. Um, it's really a tiny sample. So what, what you do really need is a lot of camera, a lot of sampling points, a lot of cameras in order to make sure that you um, get enough precision in your estimates to be able to say something about what's happening on the landscape. Another benefit, though, is that you, you do end up collecting data on the broader, um, I, I wrote mammal community, but, you know, wildlife community um, concurrently, right? You're not just getting information on a target species. Um, but I would caution that a little bit. What we're finding and what we're having to sort of account for and pivot towards in our work is that not all camera trap deployment protocols um, get you the same level of detection, uh, high detection probability across different uh, species, right? So you, you do have to maybe assess and adjust your protocols depending on what you are after. So for example, in this picture here, we've done a paired height experiment where we have cameras placed on the same tree, but at different heights to capture different sized animals. And of course, another feature um, that you can use the images for, especially if you take time-lapse images, which are images that are taken um, you know, at a set period of time, say every day or every couple of hours, um, you can really collect data on a lot of supplemental ecosystem characteristics uh, phenology stages, vegetation growth, snow periods, um, even temperature. The cameras often will report temperature um, and you can use that information in a lot of different ways. Um, I'll just quickly talk about a case study um, that we did with aerial ungulate surveys in the province of Alberta, um, just because this is a this is an aerial focused crowd. Um, we we're interested in moose density in wildlife management units, which are these polygons in the map here. And Alberta Environment and Parks, which is our provincial ministry, conducts uh, semi-regular aerial ungulate surveys to count moose in these areas, particularly in the northern part of the province. So we paired our camera trap data with 28 of these management units uh, and assessed how, how good of a match there was between the, the data from the two um, types. I'll just quickly say, not bad, <laughs> the positive relationship. There was some wider scatter at higher densities of moose. Um, we found that cameras sort of overestimate the, the true density reported by aerial, aerial surveys. But at the same time, if that's consistent, that's still a useful metric that we can glean from cameras. Um, I'll just refer you to your, a paper that we wrote about this if you're interested. Um, yeah, so just, a, just one last slide here, additional complementarity that I see. Um, you know, camera traps can be paired with other remote sensing techniques. Um, you can use camera trap images and various verification processes that remotely sensed uh, data provides you. Um, I think a lot of potential is in, you know, things like what Greg was talking about with uh, restoration of like say linear features, you can pair camera traps with, with sort of that, to, to capture that wildlife behavior and use element and get, and really, understand those ecological processes and how wildlife are responding on the ground to different treatments. Um, so there's a couple papers that look into that kind of thing. And yeah, that's all I've got. Thanks so much. Um, happy to answer questions and feel free to shoot me an email anytime. Great. Thanks, Marcus. I think we have a couple here before we jump into our panel. Uh... So the first is, um, are you using automatic object detection, for example, CNN, to automatically process your images and eliminate false detections? Yep, yep, we do. We use a, uh, there's a platform that we use, it's called WildTracks, and it's a really nice project management software tool that um, allows multiple people, people to uh, work on a camera trap tagging process project, and there is some built-in classifiers that help us really cut down on the number of images, especially misfires like false positives that capture no animals at all. And another big one is cows. We get millions of images of cows, especially in the south. So we have a, a really nice AI system that just boots those images out so no one has to look at them. Great. Um, another question is, is about the information you're able to distract from the, the image images. So are you able to extract information on the wildlife 
captured in the Im images, for example, their size, age, physical condition? Yeah, um, it depends on the goal of the project. We do tag all sort of basic characteristics like age, sex, um, that type of thing. But we also, we've done a few sort of more focal focus projects where we are looking at animal behavior. Um, so we tag those images specifically based on what the animal is doing in the image. Um, and yeah, uh, another big one is sort of distance from the camera. So whether or not the the, tr the camera is triggered at what at how far uh, at varying distances, so we can estimate the sort of detection distance curve. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different stuff you can do with the images. Great, thank you. I think with that, I'm going to close out the questions, and Marcus can maybe get to them in the chat. But I know we are jumping into a panel discussion now, so thanks, Marcus. Great. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Marcus. And uh, it's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, to you all Kylie McLeod, who's the head of the Boreal Conservation Programs at Ducks Unlimited Canada. Um, and she's been one of the key members of the MB of the CCLM portal since the very beginning. Um, so with that, um, Kylie, take our panel away. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Uh, and thank you to all of our presenters for your excellent presentations and to all the wonderful questions that have been coming in in the chat. So we would like to invite all of our presenters back to have a bit of a panel discussion to see us through to the end of today's webinar. And our goal from this is to hear from this diverse group of experts, uh, spark some discussion and allow our audience to learn from their experiences. And so to get things going, we're going to have one question for each of the panelists. And we'll give you about three minutes or so to, uh, to share your responses and then open it up to the rest of our presenters to chime in. Uh, I'll try to, you know, not step on our discussions today, but keep things moving along, recognizing I think we have a lot of questions out there and uh, not, not too much time remaining. And hopefully at the end, we'll have time for uh, a few more audience questions as well. So our first uh, question today is for Travis. Uh, where do you see the biggest opportunities for growth for UAV technology in the future? And how do you think this growth will help advance conservation efforts? I think that's a, that's a very tough question. Um, I think in many ways, uh, we're still in the very early stages of, of drone technology. So uh, like 15 years ago, no one was really talking about drones and, and now they're everywhere. Um, I do think uh, as Transport Canada opens up regulations, we'll see more and more long range and long endurance drones. Um, I think that first stage of drone development, like the last 10 to 15 years, really been focused on like multi-rotor vehicles and quadcopters. Um, and that's really driven like tech development and miniaturized a lot of electronics, like the autopilot system, hardware, sensors, and cameras. But now I think um, we'll see a shift back to more conventional airplane type designs as the regulations open up and governments let us fly farther and farther. So I think people will, will want an aircraft that can fly for a few hours at a time. Um, and there aren't really any drones that can do that right now um, that, that are readily available. Um, not for any technical reason, it's just, um, it hasn't been the focus, I think. So in, in my opinion, there's a bit of a, a vacuum there. Um, at the same time, I think we're only really just scratching the surface for conservation. Uh, I mean, we feel like we're just kind of dipping our toes in by replicating like helicopter surveys with drones, right? I don't think we're really using the drones for their full potential because they're new and kind of unproven and we're still trying to figure out how to use them more effectively. Um, but I think in a few years with experience and data to back it up, I think there'll be a lot of different places you could start taking this technology ways that you could um, kind of go beyond what's possible right now. Um, you could start asking and answering questions that I think we don't even think to ask. Um, so yeah, I think uh, more and more we'll see long range type drones, the sort of thing that's perfect for conservation where you have to cover like very large areas. Um, things like also like forest resource inventory, for example. Um, yeah. so. I think that's that's my my response in a nutshell. Thank you, Travis. Uh, and I'd like to open it up to any of our other panelists to join in. 
Um, sure, I, I can add a little bit, I think. Um, two of the things that I've really seen a lot in like my short term, our short time flying drones is um, sensors keep getting better and better and batteries keep it getting better and better. Um, we've gone from flying drones for like 20 minutes to flying drones for, you know, close to an hour. Um, so this means we can cover, you know, more area. Um, and then with advancements in the sensors that we're using, we can also fly a little bit further away, especially from wildlife if we're concerned about disturbing them or, you know, causing them to move and maybe not being able to pick them up as easily. So yeah, the longer that we can fly and the better resolution of the imagery that we can collect, I think are all gonna help with conservation efforts. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, Greg or Danny or Marcus, would you like to chime in before we move on to our next question? Um, maybe I'll just say that um, I think Transport Canada also has a role to play in terms of regulating um, drone technology and how we fly. Um, I have heard that line of sight was exempt for one flight in Alberta. So I'm not sure if that's the direction that's going to move and, and that will have major implication on um, the growth of UAV technologies as well. Thank you, Greg, I see you're unmuted. So if you wanna chime in and then we'll move on to our next question. Sure, I guess the one thing I would say is that <clears throat> drones started out 15 years ago like Travis said, I mean, they're essentially cinematography equipment. I mean, they're used to shoot skateboarders and movies and things like that. So they had little cameras on them and you could do cool things, but never people didn't think of them as survey instruments, but they, they truly are now. And so when I think of like, you know, what things will emerge here for the conservation community um, as growth opportunities is things that you used to survey in the field, boots on the ground with your hypsiometers and your VBH tapes and whatever. I mean, these are now precision survey instruments. So I think that as people get their head wrapped around the fact that these point clouds have got, excuse me, absolute spatial accuracies in the decimeters, um, and we can use them to do like really um, good surveys, that that's where I see the big, the big opportunities. Thank you. Uh, so our next question, we'll start with you, Morgan, and uh, the flip side to the previous one. But uh, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges for growth? Um, so there's definitely a couple of challenges that come to mind uh, pretty quickly with this kind of stuff. Uh, the first one really, I think, is location accessibility. So it doesn't really matter what kind of you know application you're trying to use your UAV for. You're going to have to plan your flights around things like controlled airspace or land ownership. Uh, populated areas, making sure that things are safe, of course, um, and other federal regulations. Um, it's been mentioned too already, uh, but you're also going to have to stay within your uh, UAV piloting license uh, limitations, like line of sight is the biggest complaint that I've heard. Uh, and that's especially a challenge when it comes to, we, we use UAVs because they're able to access areas that we can't. And if you're having to maintain line of sight all the time, that means that there's a lot of areas that we're still not really being able to access. Um, another factor that I think is a, a bit of a challenge for growth would be the cost. So I know that came up earlier after my presentation asking about, well, how much do these things actually set us back? And the reality is a lot of the, the newer builds can be quite, quite expensive. Um, and more than just the airframe, there's also the cost of having to purchase your sensors. And again, depending on the goals that you have, you might actually need more than one sensor. Um, so, you know, you might need like a LiDAR sensor or a multispectral sensor or a thermal sensor in my case. And some of these sensors can set you back up to, you know, $20,000, making them pretty hard for a lot of people to access and to apply. Um, something else that's a little bit of a challenge for growth, I think that often gets overlooked. Um, we often focus on going out into the field and flying the drone, but not so much about how we're going to handle the data when we get back home with it. Um, so storing and organizing, managing your data, and backing all of this, you know, large data sets, um, it's not an easy task. There's a lot of storage and a lot of organization that has to happen. And you also need to have a powerful enough computer to be able to process all of the data that you're collecting. So whether or not you're producing orthomosaics or digital surface models or working with large LiDAR data sets, 
um, having an appropriate computer setup uh, might be a bit of a barrier for entry for some uh, and might also slow things down too. Um, all that being said though, I don't think that we're really gonna see these things slow us down for very long. Uh, using UAVs is definitely something that's growing a lot um, and leading to all kinds of new innovations for getting around these kinds of challenges. Thank you, Morgan. Carrie covered a wide breadth. <laughs> Uh, would any of the other panelists like to chime in on some of the things you see as challenges that perhaps weren't touched on in her response? Um, I, I mean, I think Morgan hit everything there. I would just like to underline, yeah, the, the regulations is, is a big one. It seems like every few years there's kind of a seismic shift in, in the drone regulations. So um, just waiting for the other shoe to drop with like the on visual line of sight and, and what happens after that. Yeah, Morgan did a great job. Um, <clears throat> I just want to point out on the regulatory front, things have simplified a lot. <laughs> I mean, we sort of went for the Wild West days about, you know, eight, 10 years ago where you could do whatever you want to things being shut down almost completely where you needed an S SFOC to do anything. And now at least there's a lot of exemptions and getting your basic drone pilot's license and flying small drones, it's easy. Um, and it's not that difficult to get your advanced license and fly bigger drones and more airspace. So I would say it's definitely becoming more accessible. Um, so you're right. I mean, we're a long ways away from, you know, beyond visual line of sight, but yeah, the, the days of waiting, I think, for this regulatory technology to simplify, um, they've got, it's gotten a lot better. All right. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so that will move on to our next question. Uh, so Marcus, for you, uh, how do the unique needs of different sectors or projects, so say forestry restoration versus oil sands reclamation, wildlife conservation, uh, influence uh, decisions around which remote sync technologies to use? Uh, what are the key drivers in determining whether LIDAR, drones, cameras are the best technology to apply for gathering uh, data for a given purpose or project? Um, <laughs> I feel like a bit of a dinosaur here, <laughs> but I'm going to, I'll continue my my, my boots on the ground perspective, and I'll kind of just speak to wildlife monitoring. Um, I think, yeah, it really, really depends on, and I guess on your goal for the project. Like, I think a lot of people, especially in the camera world, are sort of defaulting to cameras are the latest and greatest and the best to to do wildlife surveys. I think it depends, I mean, if your goal is is very specific, if it's grizzly bear monitoring and, you know, you can do hair snares, you know, you can do something simple. Um, uh, or maybe if you just want to count moose in an area, I think an aerial survey still is a really fantastic tool. Um, but if you are looking for a more, a broader survey, broader community um, wildlife perspective, I think cameras are a really good option for that. Um, I will follow the work of these folks. Um, with a lot of interest, I'm really excited about the the thermal imaging and the forward looking infrared type of techniques. I think that um, Travis was mentioning to count wildlife, and I think that's really exciting. So, yeah, I think yeah, there's there's lots to take into consideration depending on what the goals of your project are. Thank you. And uh, can we open it up to perhaps one other panelist if you'd like to chime in, just so we make sure we make it through all of our questions today? I think there's a pretty basic rule of thumb that that, that I use is I wouldn't I only use mature technologies. Um, you know, unless you're a researcher and are looking for a lot of frustration, only use mature technologies. And this is why people are using cameras. Because CCD arrays and cameras, I mean, people have been developing those things for decades. So you can take a good little RGB camera, stick it on a drone and get great data. But, you know, I waited a long time before I bought a LiDAR because I know that LiDARs are huge and you got to miniaturize that thing. And then the first few people who try and fly LiDARs on drones, it's going to be awful. Um, you know, so I'm similarly skeptical about early thermal data or multispectral data, hyperspectral data, stay away from that stuff until a generation or two in front of you has bought it and are, are happy with what, what they get. I think that LIDAR is now here, the Zen use 
um, L1 is the first LiDAR that I've been tempted to buy. It actually works. It works very well. Um, I bought the H20T, the same instrument that Morgan has flown. I'm not as thrilled about with that one, but I don't know. Yeah, wait just a little bit before you invest. All right, would anyone uh, like to try? Oh, no, we'll move on to the next question. All right, so uh, Danny, how, how can we improve training opportunities for people who want to use remote technologies? Uh, great question. Um, I, I think that curriculum is changing. I you know, hear about enrollment in land reclamation at U of A and how they really need to revamp um, that degree program. And I think here's an opportunity to really bring some of that training into university as well as to tech colleges like SIA, SAIT, and NATE. Um, I'm going to date myself here, but I think, you know, going to university in the early 2000s, R was not something that you hear about. And that really has come on um, in the last 10 years. So I think that should be something that's regularly taught in even a diploma program so that a lot of the graduates come out with that base knowledge of how to use R or maybe even Python so that they can certainly um, pick up these learnings of applying remote sensing technology and data processing uh, a lot quicker than having to start from scratch. Um, and I think data collection from remote sensing, especially drone, can be done with you know, a, a service provider. And I think it's not necessary that everyone own their own drone to collect data necessarily, but certainly that data processing is something that's more challenging and a user guide that we develop for data collection and processing would be very helpful. Um, and that can be certainly implemented in any training that we give to future users. Thank you, Danny. Uh, Travis or Morgan, do you, would you like to chime in on that one? Um, sure. Um, so I have a bit of a frustrating response to this question, I suppose, but I really do find that experience is one of the best ways of, of learning a lot of these things. And, you know, there can be that temptation of wanting to learn everything before you try something. Uh, but for myself and in my experience, I found just having troubleshooting skills and being able to develop those and apply them to, you know, working with new technologies in the field or working with the data when you, you know, get back home and you're in the lab and you're trying to extract valuable information from it is just being able to apply problem solving methods to it. And uh, yeah, I but I would definitely agree that learning how to program is a really big part of that. So Python is huge. Um, there's all kinds of of um, open source material that you can use and apply to you, answer remote sensing technology questions. Thank you. Uh, Travis, is there something you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, I agree with with what Morgan was saying, that experience is kind of the, the best teacher that I had, I think, when it comes to this sort of thing. So actually getting to be hands on with the technology um, makes a big difference. And I think uh, that that does mean getting involved at the university level um, in, in these degree programs and, and making sure that's integrated as a part of it. I think that would go a long way for sure. Thank you. And uh, we'll move on to the last question of our panel piece here. And I've seen lots of questions coming in the chat. So I think we should have a few minutes to answer some of those. Uh, so Greg, last, last questions for you. Uh, in what ways do you see drone technology supporting Indigenous self-governance when it comes to conservation? Wow, well, yeah, hard question. I mean, I'm a remote sensing person. I don't know very much about Indigenous self-governance, so I can only speculate a little bit. So, I mean, the, the thing that I see, and it doesn't just apply to Indigenous self-governance, but it applies to everyone who's trying to, you know, gain greater control and understanding of their lands around them is that, just like I said at the, at the outset, I think that this is the technology, this is the platform that, that really has sort of democratized remote sensing. 
and made it, it made it easy for just about anyone to buy a sophisticated survey instrument and be able to, you know, do things at a reasonable cost, you know, without having to hire an aircraft or a helicopter to do every little thing you want. Um, you can now, with the regulatory environment evolving, um, at least within visual line of sight, you can do some very good surveying. And so I just wanted to maybe reiterate something I, I mentioned briefly, and that is up until I would say about three years ago, the drones we were using were essentially platforms for doing videography. I mean, that's what they were designed for. That's what they were originally used for, multi-rotor things that would follow you around on your skateboard. Um, and they could be used to do other things, but it wasn't until just the last few years, as soon as the, the DJI Matrice 300 RTK was released, that's the first real surveying drone. That's the drone that, um, you know, I've seen a couple of times um, on these presentations. This is the one I would encourage you to buy if you're serious about surveying. It does, um, you know, precision surveying with accuracies in the decimeter level and the, the price point for entry is, is pretty good. I would say it's probably $20,000 with all of your bits and pieces on it, right? um, plus maybe another five to 10K per sensor that you wanna add. And the ones that I think that are um, good for buying right now are optical sensors and a LiDAR sensor. I will see on, uh, on thermal how it goes, but anyway, um, so in, in, in to the point that you can, you know, contribute to some of the, you know, self-governance questions that are happening in the indigenous communities with new technologies and issues like this, it, it can only help. So that's about the extent I can speculate on this, this sort of technology supporting self-governance. Thank you, Greg. And I uh, see that Marcus, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to piggyback on this question, uh, maybe expand it out from drone to, to cameras as we've uh, we, we work with a lot of Indigenous communities, in, especially in the oil sands region um, of the province, and we found that like remote cameras are just amazing way to really engage the communities, um, in, like with respect to the, the animals on their land and, and tapping into their knowledge about that. Like, it's just really great tool to, to, to share, you know, their idea of the landscape and, and what's happening and, and how we can implement the cameras to help them ask questions about what's going on on their land and them seeing seeing the images and, and a great way to engage um, the youth and the communities is, has been a really, really bright spot for our work with remote cameras. So just a little plug for cameras there. <laughs> Everyone loves looking at pictures of, of cute animals <laughs> or Very tasty cute. animals. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Danny, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, just to add to that, I think that um, if we can make the data or images or anything that we collect freely available to the communities, I think that's a really great step. Um, it's not really to say how we want them to use that necessarily, it's for them to actually have that data so that they can see it for themselves. And I think that's really important to find a mechanism where we can get gather all that data together in the same portal and then allowing the communities to tap into that. Um, and right now there's really no clear way to do that. I know everyone's kind of working in their own little silo and um, you know we probably fly over the same area multiple times a year. So um, it'd be really great to actually find a way for everyone to kind of come together and put our data in the same place. Uh, Morgan or Travis, would you like to weigh into this question? Um, I can weigh in a little bit. Um, I definitely agree with, um, well, with what everyone has said so far, but uh, something that Marcus said that definitely stood out to me was just the being able to engage with the communities so I've had uh, the opportunity of getting to go to two different Indigenous communities and fly UAVs and, um, you know, be able to speak to them about what kinds of imagery we were collecting and uh, they expressed a lot of interest in it. So I think being able to, you know, hand the controller over, controller over and say, you know, here, you, you know, can fly and be able to collect all the information that you would like about your land. It's, you know, incredible.
All right. Well, we are in the last few minutes of our webinar. I know we've had lots of questions come in. I just want to check in, Christy, do we have time for any of the, the chat questions or are those for presenters to follow up with uh, after our, our webinar today? We can maybe do one before we close out. And there was one question that came in right when the, the panel started, kind of about the idea of public perception and how do you deal with drones and the idea that people think that they're a form of surveillance by a big brother and negative public perception around the use of drones. So we have a couple minutes to address that one. I don't know if anyone wants to give a comment or. Uh, yeah, I can start out. Um, usually when we're out flying, doing our surveying, um, like typically we will follow the plane with, with a car that has our ground station in it. And a lot of times people will stop and, and talk to us about what we're doing. Um, and usually when they, when they find out we're doing something like censusing wildlife, then, then they're really kind of enthusiastic and, and interested in it. Um, we haven't come across someone yet who, who was upset about what we were doing. Now, I think, um, I think that comes down to the use case. I think, I think people really, um, appreciate sort of these, these conservation related, um, use cases, especially like a lot of the people we come across are our hunters and they're interested in knowing that that the government is there and, and censusing the animals and um, they're always interested to see how their knowledge stacks up against what we've seen um, you know they'll tell us oh like we think there's something down there um, you know yeah so uh, the the community has always been um, pretty pretty receptive to, to what we're doing um, I think if we did take this technology and apply it in another use case, like something surveillance related or law enforcement related, then I do see um, how, how that would definitely be, be more of an issue. Thanks. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Um, this is our concluding part. I don't know, Matt, if you have any closing comments. Sure, I'll just say um, it's been a pleasure uh, hosting this this webinar and I thank our, our speakers so so much and our and Kylie for being our fearless panel leader. Um, stay tuned for more knowledge exchange seminars that the CCLM will be bringing to you um, and be sure to check out the CCLM portal anytime. That's where you can stay up to date on what's coming um, and you can find those resources that you need so much to do the work that you do. And with that, I'd like to say have a good afternoon everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.